What's up my little cashews? We are going to do a chapter three review today. We're gonna go over everything you learned about these wonderful things called polynomials. And I know you love polynomials. You've been loving polynomials since the day you learned to say the word polynomial. It just rolls off the tongue, don't it? Polynomial. Anyway, um, so we're gonna learn a bunch of different stuff today. I think, well, I don't think, I know, because I just wrote the notes, but there were six distinct things you had to learn about polynomials. So we're gonna go ahead and relearn those at light speed. That way you don't have to sit and watch all six 30 minute videos. You're gonna watch one 30 minute video and that's my goal, all right? Uh, yeah, if it's not 30 minutes or less, your money back. All right, so let's start with the easiest, most straightforward thing because you've done it about 15 times at this point. We're gonna find the vertex of a quadratic. So the first thing you need to know is there is a formula to find the vertex of a quadratic and it goes a little something like x equals negative b over 2a. Super important that you don't forget that b. That's the number one mistake students make when they're doing this formula. And then once we actually read the question, I'll tell you the second biggest mistake students make doing these types of problems. So this a and b refers to if we're looking at a regular quadratic, it's the coefficients of the squared term, that's A, and the linear term, that's B. This constant just moves the whole thing up and down. And because we're looking for the X value of our vertex, so if we look at a picture of a parabola, there's our parabola. If you take the parabola part and you move it up and down, this vertex is always gonna be at the same x spot. So it kind of makes sense that it doesn't depend on c. So we're going to use this formula to find the vertex of our quadratic. And on your homework, there'll be, I think probably two questions like this where they give you a quadratic in a word problem. And the word problem's not super inspired, right? It's usually like a baseball. It, it's something falling in Earth's atmosphere. They're all just cheap, lowbrow physics problems that no one wants to do. So um, we're, we're gonna do this cheap, lowbrow problem, you know? So let's read it. It says, given that h of t is equal to negative five t squared plus 20 t plus one as an equation that shows the height h. So all they're telling us is that this y value here Whatever pops out, that's the height of the thing. Of a baseball, the baseball is the thing. In yards, there's our units, so that we can put units on the thing at the end. As a function of time, t in seconds. So you'll notice these are all t's. Whoops, that's not a t, back up, back up. Hold on, undo. t there, t there. Normally they're x's, see the x and the x. They just replace them with t's because we're talking about time instead of x. Um, so the x is time in this, and then the y is the height of the baseball. So at what time would the base baseball reach the maximum height? So let's read that, the actual question here one more time. At what time, so are we looking for x or are we looking for y? X, Mr. Barton, you just told us that's time. Very good students. You guys must have a great teacher. You are so stinking hardworking. Not smart. Some of you are a little smart, but most of you are hardworking and you only made it this far because of hard work and determination. And I, that that's on your mom, you know? Cow, just kidding. <laughs> um, all right, so let's quit joking around. Let's do this problem. So we are looking for the T value here. Um, so all we have to do is find the x. So we're just gonna apply this formula to this quadratic and then whatever pops out, that's how long it took in seconds for your ball to reach a maximum height. So b here would be 20 and a would be negative five. So t equals negative, negative 20. This negative is from the formula and this negative is from, whoops, sorry, whoops, ooh, hang on. I think I might be making a mistake here. Just kidding, that's a positive. Okay, here we go. Just kidding, it's a plus 20. Over 
2 times for real this time, negative 5. Then we simplify, so we have negative 20 over negative 10, and then this simplifies to 2 seconds. Okay, so the number one mistake students make is they don't put this negative sign into the equation when we're looking for x. The second most common mistake that students make when doing these problems is when they read this, they automatically assume that we're looking for y. In this problem, you don't have to plug this back in to get y. They're asking how much time it would take. If they said, how high did the ball go? Then we want to know the height. And you would have to take this two seconds and plug it back into both of those, into the original equation, to get the height. But because they only ask us for time, we don't need to do that and we can just stop. The answer is two seconds. Okay. So make sure you read the question and figure out, are you looking for the t or the x, or are you looking for the height or the y value? All right, next lesson. The next one we need to talk about is n behavior. And this one's a little bit easier because you don't actually have to do any math. You pretty much just look at the question and then write down the answer. There's no calculating or formulas you need to know. There's just simple calculations you need. All right, before we get going, I don't remember how these are formatted on your homework. Okay, listen to me. What, what, put down your phone, quit Snapchatting. Just put it down. Quit looking at that stupid TikTok. It's not even funny. That kid has put on makeup like 18 times. Quit looking at it. Listen to me. Are you listening? Okay. I don't remember if the negative X is on the top or the bottom on your homework. So you've got to read. You've got to engage your brain muscle and think about it when you get to the homework. You can't just copy exactly what I'm doing here. You have to think. I know. I, I'm asking the impossible, but you've got to use your brain muscle. Just check when you get the negative one might be on the bottom, so don't fill in the bottom for, you know what I mean? Use your brain. Okay, let's do the problem. So for the end behavior of polynomials, what you want to start with is looking at the leading coefficient because that determines the end behavior of the right side. That would be the positive side as x goes to positive infinity. For me, it's the bottom line. For you, it might be the top line. You have to read. Okay. You can't tell that I'm bitter, can you? You can't tell that I've watched students make this mistake literally thousands of times. Don't worry. I, I won't even be a little mad when you make it, but I'm going to point it out to you. Okay. So the leading coefficient, that's this number right here and this number right here. Those tell us the end behavior of the right side as x goes to positive infinity because on an xy axis, this side's positive, this side's negative. Then the degree, that tells us the left side. And it tells us, does it match or does it go in the opposite direction? So let's start with the leading coefficient. What we're looking for is, is it positive or is it negative? The infinity that you're heading towards should match the sign of the leading coefficient. So here for this f of x, because our leading coefficient is negative six, that means as we go to the right, our y value should go to a negative value. So because this is negative, this is negative. There we go. For this one, because our leading coefficient is positive, as we go to the right, our y value should go to a positive number. So it's gonna go to positive infinity. All right, now we look at the degree, and that's a fancy math word for biggest exponent. I spell biggest. Wait, what's that lambda doing there? Making an X, there we go, okay. So for the exponent, we're not looking at positive or negative anymore. That's not what you look for. You look for even or odd. If it's even, they match. And if it's odd, they're opposite. See, odd, opposite, it alliterates. So here we examine our exponent. It's a five. 
Now you look at your fingers, you count them, you see if you can make groups of two. One, two, three, four. Oh, I've got a fifth one left over. Look, look, here's your fingers. There you go, that's a hand. One group of two, second group of two. Oh, look, little piggies left over. This is an odd number. That means they are opposite signs. So because this one is negative, this one must be positive. Now we look over here. Two is an even number. So because it's even, our end behaviors match. So because this one goes to a positive, so does this one. And that's end behavior. It's that simple, children. All right, next lesson, imaginary numbers. Um, remember the definition of I, just for those of us in the back who uh, weren't listening. It's the square root of negative one, but you just treat it, treat it like a variable. I is not a variable, hang on, but it acts like one. Okay, so just pretend it is, it's not, but treat it like one uh, and, and you'll get through this. So we've just got a couple example problems just for the kids at home. So here we have a subtraction problem. So what we're gonna do is we're going to subtract this complex number and this complex number. So the way you start that is you distribute the negative to the second one. So we have three minus four i minus six plus eight i. Now you just combine your like terms. And when I say like terms, I mean you combine the real numbers with the real numbers and the imaginary numbers with the imaginary numbers. So three and negative six are both real. So three minus six is negative three. And then negative four i and plus eight i are both imaginary. So negative four plus eight is positive four i. And that's your answer, you're done. Wonderful. Now we have some multiplication problems. Um, this is just a generic run of the mill, random, nothing special about it multiplication problem. This one is a little bit special and it has a special word, but we'll get there in a second. For multiplication problems, you're just distributing or foiling however your past teachers have said it. So we're gonna make sure we distribute this two to both of these and this negative i to both of these, and then we'll clean it up. So two times three is six, two times two i is four i, negative i times three is negative three i, and negative i times two i is negative two i squared. Now we need to remember that it's forbidden to leave i's with exponents on them. This is no bueno, you gotta get rid of that. So you have to remember that i is the square root of negative one. i squared, if you square this, it cancels the radical and you get negative one. Just for completeness, i to the third power is negative uh, i, All right? And then i to the fourth power is positive one. I think you'll only need these first two. Uh, and really, I mean just this one but you should know the others. So i squared turns into a negative one and it's being multiplied to this negative two. So this turns into a plus two when we simplify. Now you combine your like terms. So six plus two is eight and then four i minus three i is just one i. We don't write coefficients of one because they look ugly. All right, now the special one. These are what are called conjugate, uh, hang on, I can't spell and talk, conjugate pairs. And what that means is they're the exact same, except the sign of the imaginary parts are flipped. So what that's gonna do for us is it's gonna make doing the problem a little bit simpler because uh, stuff is gonna cancel. So same process, FOIL or distribute, however you like to say it. So two x times two x is four x squared. 2x times negative 3x is negative 6xi. 3i times 2x is positive 6xi. And now you can see where it's gonna cancel. And 3i times negative 3i is negative 9i squared. 
So these two terms cancel, and this i squared turns into a negative 1, and it switches the sign of this to a plus 9. So we have 4x squared plus 9, and then these aren't like terms because this has x's and this doesn't, so you just leave it that way. All right, one more problem. The last type of problem we need to do has i in the denominator, and I want to the, the word I want to use here is rationalize. Um, the denominator, but I don't, that's not the right math word. Um, like you can't have two over the square root of three. You can't have radicals on the bottom, so we have to rationalize it. But that's because this is an irrational number. This isn't irrational, it's imaginary. So the word I kind of want to use, but I don't know that this is like textbook math, is real eyes. We've got to realize this problem. But I don't think they're going to say that in a math textbook, but it makes me feel good. So the way we realize or make the denominator of this fraction real is we multiply the top and the bottom of this fraction by the conjugate of this imaginary number, or complex number rather. It's called complex when it has a real and an imaginary part, just so we know. So we're going to multiply by the conjugate of this. So 4 plus 3i and 4 plus 3i. So on the top, we just distribute the 5. So 5 times 4 is 20, and 5 times 3i is 15i. There we go. Now on the bottom, we have to FOIL because we have a binomial times a binomial. So 4 times 4, 16. 4 times 3i is positive 12i. Negative 3i times 4 is negative 12i, and the middle cancels out, just like we anticipated from a conjugate. And then negative 3i times negative 3i is, or sorry, times positive 3i, is negative 9i squared. And we just saw right there how the i squared turns into a negative 1. Let's just do it, negative 1. And then that turns this into a plus 9. So these two cancel. And then 16 plus 9 is 25. So we have 20 plus 15i over 25. And we can reduce this fraction because 5 goes into 20, 15, and 25. So we're going to divide everything by 5. So 5 goes into 20 four times. 5 goes into 15 three times, don't forget your i, and then five goes into 25, five times, and then that's your answer. All right, we're halfway there. I believe that is the first three lessons. So far, so good. All right, now we need to create a couple of polynomials, and the way we create polynomials is we need to turn, sorry, let me elaborate. We need to create polynomials if they give us some zeros. So it says create a polynomial with zeros at x equals negative 2, x equals 0, x equals 3, and x equals 5. That just means if you graph this thing, at negative 2 it'll cross the x-axis, at 0 it'll cross the x-axis, at 3, and at 5. So it might look something like that. Something like that, anyway. Um, so the way we create a polynomial with these zeros is we need to turn these zeros into binomials first. So we're just going to move all of these numbers so that they're over with the x by doing an inverse math operation. So here we would add 2 on both sides. So we have x plus 2 equals 0. 0 plus 0 still x. Subtract 3 to move the 3 over with the x. So it's x minus 3. And then subtract the 5. So we have x minus 5. Once we have our binomials, we just FOIL them all together. So I'm actually going to move this one out front. I'm going to do that one last because it's easiest. So let's get FOIL and kids. All right, so x times x is x squared. x times negative 3 is negative 3x. 
um, 2 times x is positive 2x, and then x times negative 3 is negative 6. Clean this up. This is x squared minus x minus 6. All right, so we just use these two. So I'm going to cross them out so I don't use them again. I haven't multiplied by x minus 5 yet, so I'm going to just bring that down and FOIL that next. Okay, so x squared times x is x to the third. x times, uh, oh, let's do this in order. x squared times negative 5 is negative 5x squared. Negative x times x is negative x squared. Uh, negative x times negative 5 is plus 5x. Negative 6 times x is negative 6x. Negative 6 times negative 5 is positive 30. So now we're going to clean this one up. So bring down our x cubed because it has no like terms. Negative 5x squared minus x squared is negative 6x squared. 5x minus 6x is negative x plus 30. And we still haven't used this x, so we're going to bring it down. And we're just going to distribute it in. And all that does is it increases the exponents by one number and puts an x on that one. So this is going to be x to the fourth minus 6x cubed minus x squared plus 30x. And this thing, if you graph it, We'll cross the x-axis at these spots. And as simple as that, easy as, uh, what's easy? What's an easy thing to do? Um, I don't know, easy, easy as uh, winning the 150cc Rainbow Road on Mario Kart 64. Just kidding, that's probably pretty hard, huh? All right, two more, and of course, we save the most difficult, arduous, thought-provoking questions for last. This one's actually pretty straightforward, but the next one's going to make you want to uh, sit and study for a long time. <laughs> so we want to find the real and imaginary zeros by factoring. Okay, so there's a big hint here at the top of the page. It tells you how to do the problem. You're going to factor. Um, I don't believe that it's going to tell you on your homework. I think it's just going to give you a problem and say, find the zeros. But you can tell you're supposed to factor if it has the same format as this. You're going to have x to the fourth, x squared, and then a number just by itself. If you see a problem like this, try to factor it first. It might be one of these crazy problems. But if it looks like this, it's probably not, and you can probably factor. So we're going to factor this. So we want two numbers. They're going to multiply to negative 5 and add up to 4. So that's going to be plus 5 and minus 1. And then the x here, we need two things that will multiply to give us x to the fourth power. So that's going to be x squared and x squared. Now we're finding the zeros. So that means we want to know when is f of x equal to 0. So all we have to do is set these factors equal to 0 and then solve for x. So we're going to have x squared plus 5 equals 0 and x squared minus 1 equals 0. All right. This one's going to be easier. So let's do that one first. So we're trying to just get the x by itself. So plus 1 to move the 1 to the other side. These cancel. x squared equals 1. Take a square root to cancel the squared. So x equals 1. And because we're the ones doing the square root, it wasn't already on the page when we got here, that means it is plus or minus 1. So x equals plus or minus 1 is part of it. On your homework, because it's multiple guess, it's probably x equals 1, x equals negative 1. You don't have a way to type in the plus or minus symbol, so you probably have to type them like that. All right, now this one's a little bit tougher. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to isolate the x squared. So minus 5, minus 5. These cancel. So we have x squared equals negative 5. And we're going to take a square root. 
All right, so of course those cancel and we get just x on the left. On the right, this negative, something special happens to it. When you take the square root of a negative, the negative leaves the radical and turns into an i. So then we just have the square root of five, because that's gone now. And you don't know the square root of five. So you just leave it in the radical, radical five. So it's plus or minus, because we took the square root, i radical five. Um, I believe the i will be in front, but you might see it in back. I don't know that uh, it necessarily matters. I think it's kind of mathematician's choice here, but I usually put it in front. It looks a little nicer to me that way. Okay, so there you go. There's finding it if you can factor. Now let's go talk about if you can't factor. This is the one that you guys all moaned about and went, oh, but Mr. Bard, and when am I gonna use this in real life? Well, kids, when the earth inevitably is ruined by humans due to our own lack of consideration and responsibility for the use of fossil fuels, um, plastics, spraying chemicals into the air, polluting our oceans and killing sea turtles, we're gonna have to leave and those rockets aren't gonna build themselves. So when you're trying to build a rocket to escape this veritable hell that we've created for ourselves, you're gonna need this. So you better listen up. So it says finding all zeros and, and that all is gonna make you so upset, but we got to do what we got to do to make that rocket. So let's let's do it. So we're going to find all the zeros using synthetic division. I'll refresh your brains on that. So it says, given that negative 3 is a zero of this polynomial, find the remaining. The first thing you want to know is how many are there? So because that number right there, the biggest exponent, is a 4, that means there are four answers to this problem. They told us one. It's right there. It's negative three. Because we're smart. No, no, no. Because we're hardworking, we know a second one. No, this one's actually probably because we're smart. These have a GCF of x. So we're going to factor the x out as step one. So f of x equals x 3x cubed plus 16x squared minus 9x, nope, plus 9x, minus 36. Because of this GCF right there, we're looking for zeros. So if I set this equal to zero, zero times anything is zero. So x equals zero is the other answer that we get for free because of the x GCF. If x is a GCF x equals zero is a zero. <laughs> there we go. So we get that one for free because there's an x in every single term. All right. Now, here's the hard part. Come on, get out of here. The hard part is this stuff this stuff isn't just going to go quietly into night. You can't just shove a black bag over this thing's head, shove it into the back of a car, and it's never heard from again. This thing's going to kick and scream and fight the whole way. So we've got to whoop this thing's butt with synthetic division to make it give us the answers. So let's do that. So for synthetic division, you want to make this big L just for organization. And then we're going to write our coefficients across the top. So we have 3, 16, 9, at negative 36. The way we're going to synthetically divide this, you need to know what are you dividing by? And the key is right here. It's this negative three. We, so what we're doing here is it told us that negative three is a root to this thing or a zero. So this synthetic division is going to pull that zero out and then we're crossing our fingers and praying that we can solve the remaining stuff using other conventional methods like factoring or completing the square or quadratic formula. So again, for synthetic division, coefficients across the top, the zero that they give you outside, and here we go. 
first number, you drop it straight down. Do not do anything to it. Once the number is outside of the L, you multiply it to this outside zero that they give us and put the product under the next number. So negative three times nine, uh, times three, negative nine, giving away the answer a little bit there. Then you combine like terms or add or subtract. It's whatever the signs say. So it's 16 minus nine, so this is seven. Multiply to the zero again, so this is negative 21. Nine minus 21 is negative 12. And then negative 12 times negative three is positive 36. Negative 36 plus 36 is zero. If you don't get a zero right there, you did something wrong. This zero is your remainder. And for this to actually be a zero, it has to go in evenly and there can't be a remainder. So if you don't get zero here, you probably messed up a sign somewhere in here, or maybe you didn't make that the right sign, or maybe you multiplied here when you weren't supposed to, but there's a problem somewhere. All right, so we just had x to the third power. We took one of the zeros out, so that reduces the power of all of these terms. So it was x cubed, now it's three x squared. This was squared, now this is to the first power, so plus seven x minus 12 and then no remainder. Now this thing, because it's a quadratic, we have infallible tools that will solve this for us. Um, so your options here are, you can try the, there's a lot of names for it, the box method or the monkey method or the, I don't know, where you multiply this number here to the end and then you do simple factoring and then you divide by this number and so on. Um, because I already know the answer to this problem, I'm not gonna let you try that because it's not gonna work. Um, unfortunately, this thing is just straight up not factorable. The only way you can get the real answer is by doing the quadratic formula or completing the square. I personally am not a huge fan of completing the square. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do quadratic formula on this bad boy. So quadratic formula is x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four times a times c all over two times a. Now we're gonna clean this thing up. x equals negative seven plus or minus the square root 49 plus, because this negative and this negative cancel and become plus, Four times three is 12. 12 times 12 is 144. Two times three is six. Now we add these two numbers. So we have negative seven plus or minus the square root. This is 193 over six. And this number is prime. So it's stuck that way. It means there's no factors of this. The only factors are one and 193. So this is the answer. And you're gonna say, but Mr. Barton, I could have sworn you said there were two more answers here. Well, there are, look, a plus and a minus. So we have negative seven plus the square root of 193 over six. And then we have negative seven minus the square root of 193 over six. So there are three zeros, four zeros, excuse me. All right, so now that you thoroughly have really just, I, I can't even put into words, you know, um, just grown your love of math through this video. Every example, you could feel your heart swell with love and appreciation for mathematics. Please, if you want to go tell me how grateful you are for providing to you such wonderful, concise, he says at 34 minutes and 35 seconds, knowledge, go hit me up in the WebEx and let me know how you really feel. I'll see you next time.